Testing, testing, one, two, one, two. All right, welcome back to the Corporate Cowboys podcast as we read Stuck, How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss. The authors are Victoria Grady and Patrick McCreesh. My name is Alex and I will be reading this book to you. The publisher of this book is Productivity Press 2022. Now, where we left off was, I believe, in chapter 8, Leading a Stuck Organization. And as always, they begin with a couple of quotes in the beginning here. The first by Woodrow Wilson. If you want to make enemies, try to change something. And yeah, Woodrow Wilson was absolutely right even though he changed almost absolutely nothing. Except, you know, they, they did low-key kind of make, uh, low-key kind of create the UN, right? <clears throat> it is what it is. Um, you know, blue helmets and all. We don't, we don't like blue helmets around her. <coughs> People are very open-minded about new things, as long as they're exactly like the old ones. And that one is by Charles F. Kettering. Charles F. Kettering. Aris or Aris, Aris Scarla is not your average civil servant. He has served over 25 years in the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA. He started his career as an inspector and continued to grow through the ranks of the agency as a manager, leader, and an agent for change. In 2014, Aris was charged with creating a change management management program for the Flight Standards Service. He was dedicated to building a capability for change within the FAA. Aris engaged leaders in active conversation about the role they would play in change. He rolled out change management training to more than 4,500 employees. That's 4,500. 4,500 employees across the flight standards service. And he developed activation strategies to support the team members as they went to implement change management programs. In 2019, Aris was deep into the implementation of the FAA's Workforce uh, workforce of the Future initiative. Unfortunately, Eris continued to hit a familiar challenge. The well-trained advisors in his cohort couldn't get people to adopt the change no matter how hard they tried. There was a gap between understanding what they needed to do and their desire to change. In 2019, Eris decided he needed to study this gap and understand how to close it. He assembled a research team that leveraged the Attachment Styles Index to target his frontline leaders and managers. The response rate to the survey was good, and he was confident the tool would provide him insights to support his program. The assessment revealed that overall, the breakdown of individuals' attachment styles was close to what we would expect, with 84% of cohort being stable, 7% distracted, 2% autonomous, and 5% insecure. While this is consistent with other organizations, there is no right attachment style. In fact, such a high number of stable individuals can create a challenge in an organization as stable individuals are often blind to the challenge of others. Stable individuals often discount or are unaware of the change impact on those individuals in the organization who are not securely attached, who are not stable. Given that this cohort were frontline leaders and managers, it is likely that the workplace itself was not stable. In short, his leaders may have isolated his employees. The assessment also revealed some uncertainty about the program itself. Only 61% of the frontline leaders understood the vision for the change effort and barely half agreed that there would be from that there would be from the new program 52% in parentheses 
These leaders were essential for the success of the change initiative, yet many did not understand why they were doing it and most felt there was no benefit. How could Aries expect them to have a desire for change? Worse, what kind of message were they sending to the people that worked for them? The team developed three tactical adjustments with Aries that his team could begin immediately. 1. Develop a translation process for leadership vision at the operational level. 2. Test the messages in areas of the organization where cultural differences are known to exist. 3. Coach the leadership to strategically communicate the change message without imposing a secure attachment message. Okay. As we fast forward to 2021, we have seen the Flight Standards Program succeed and become a model for other programs in the federal government. Not only did Aris roll out the program across flight standards, he developed a position description for the FAA and he developed a government-wide position description for a change advisor. When the FAA set out to build the change management program, the goal was to be the quote-unquote gold standard, and Aris believes that's exactly what he has built. Like many, like so many people driving change, Aris found that leadership was a critical factor in the success of the FAA's program. He needed his leaders to be engaged in the right way, with the right understanding of the change effort to drive success. In its biannual study of change practitioners, the research and training organization ProSci consistently finds that change practitioners report that active and visible sponsorship is the number one success factor in change management efforts. When leaders understand the change they sponsor and can actively engage to advocate and mobilize for it, the change efforts succeed. Of course, this assumes the leaders can effectively connect with the organization that is stuck. In this chapter, we will explore how attachment issues impact the relationship between leaders and followers, how do relationships Man, I really fucked up that first one. And and I was going to fuck up the second one too. So the first one is a point, right? And it's a question. And it says, how do attachment styles impact the relationship between leaders and followers? Second point, how do these relationships shift during times of change? Third point is how should we rethink change management for stuck organizations? And the fourth point how does this impact the way leaders behave during times of change? Leadership is a complex topic. At any given point, you can walk down the aisle of your average airport bookstore and find a dozen new products telling you how to quote unquote lead today. Bernard Bass or Bernard Bass developed the comprehensive Handbook on Leadership, which recounts in more than 1,500 pages of encyclopedic reference the thousands of studies completed on the topic of leadership over the decade. As Bayes notes, the leader point helps set and clarify the missions and goals. Second point energizes and directs others to pursue the missions and goals. Third point helps provide the structure, method, tactics, and instruments for achieving the goals. Fourth point, helps resolve conflicting views about means and ends. Fifth point, evaluates the individual, group, or organizational contribution to the effort. Most importantly, leadership today is a relationship between the leader, the follower, and the situation. A leader needs to provide all of the skills that base outlines above while aligning the expectations and motivations of the followers in the organization against the situation at hand. For this process to work, the leader must be able to connect with the follower and create a strong relationship. We have found that attachment styles provide a good signal to the type of leadership. Fuck. <laughs> All right, don't cuss, Alex, relax. This last sentence I messed up. We have found that attachment styles provide a good signal to the type of relationship a leader and follower can develop. The leader-follower relationship. <clears throat> to understand the relationship between a leader and follower, we must study the leader, the follower, and the relationship. 
This requires creating four separate units of study, the unique attributes of the leader, the unique attribute of the follower, the leader's view of the follower, and the follower's view of the leader. This relationship is often described as a dyad. The attributes of the leader and the follower are best represented with the attachment styles index as discussed in chapter four. The relationship is measured using a tool called the Leadership Member Exchange, the LMX, questionnaire. The example is in the practical exercises. Uh, these, are the, these notes are like in parentheses. Example in the practical exercises, which allows us to determine which attributes, which allows us to determine what attributes have the strongest impact on the relationship between a leader and a follower. For this approach, we can learn a great deal about different types of leaders with different types of followers in different types of situations. As a way of reminder, the four attachment styles are stable, autonomous, distracted, and insecure. Conventional wisdom suggests that stable individuals make the best leaders due to their secure base and balance. However, stable leaders can also be blind to the challenges of other people, especially in times of change. This can make stable leaders off-putting to followers who are not stable. On the other hand, leaders with distracted style can be effective with all types of followers. These individuals are less likely to be blind to the challenges of others and demonstrate some of their own weaknesses. On the other hand, in a situation of distracted follower and stable leader, the follower is more likely to give a, pos a positive. On the other hand, in a situation of distracted follower with a dis on the other hand, in a situation of distracted follower with a stable leader, the follower is more likely to give a positive LMX score to the leader than the other way around. This is likely due to the nature of the distracted individual's low avoidance and high need for connection. Autonomous leaders and followers are more likely to provide negative feedback on the other part of their relationship, the leader or the follower, regardless of which position they hold. However, autonomous leaders receive better ratings from followers than leaders with more anxiety, likely due to their more off off hands, likely due to their more hands off approach being autonomous. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Individuals with difficulty regulating emotions, such as highly distracted or highly anxious individuals, may struggle as leaders, especially during times of change when stress may bring out their worst tendencies to self-regulate their anxiety. However, as any attachment style intensifies, the negative qualities of the style tend to outweigh the positive strengths of the style. The core of this concept is understanding the attributes of the leader and the follower to understand the relationship. Of course, each relationship or dyad will be completely different. However, this approach does help both the organization and the leader start to focus on the attributes of the people involved instead of preconceived expectations of how people should behave. The Breen, as, as Breen Brown notes, leading for true belonging is about creating a culture that celebrates uniqueness. What serves leaders best is understanding your players' best efforts. My job as a leader is to identify their unique gift or contribution. A strong leader pulls players toward a deep belief in themselves. Leader-follower relationships in times of change. Attachment styles can have a major impact on how individuals react to change. In the leader-follower relationship, these impacts will be intensified when both parts of the relationship feel the impact at the same time. As individuals, stable leaders should handle change well. While distracted leaders may become excessively reliant upon others through change, autonomous and insecure people may tend to avoid change, which could create a challenge for both the organization and their followers. Organizations may not get the advocacy and or sponsorship they need, whereas leaders may not get the information and support they need. 
Yeah, I, I mean, that makes sense. Uh, in, in terms of... In terms of autonomous and insecure people, they, they, they may tend... While they tend to avoid change, the challenge this creates for people who are distanced or who are high anxiety tend to be a break in communication, tend to be a, a disconnect in communication, which becomes all the more important, and this is just a side commentary, it becomes all the more important when an organization is going through change. So if you're trying to affect a change and and uh, help transition your associates through a time of change, then communication becomes paramount. You can't drop communication. If anything, communication should increase. Communication should evolve into more efficient forms, more efficacious forms in order to get across more information in even less time. So there's going to be even more coding. There's going to be even more uh, more streamlining messages. That, in its sense, that transition process should forge a team, should bond a team, should bond an organization and forge the individuals in an organization together for the better. But, but... That is all dependent on how capable a leader is, how capable management is in order to manage times of change, manage during change. I mean, it's it's a balancing act, and some people, some individuals are very good at it. Some people, some individuals are uh, are just suck at it. As followers, stable individuals should adapt well to effectively manage change. Distracted people can effectively handle change if the leader provides resources to help them through change. Did I not just say that? <laughs> Autonomous and insecure followers may struggle to change due to their low expectations and distrust of others. Exactly. So a capable leader would, would cultivate that trust, would lead them would lead them through that time of change in order to forge a better team at the end of the process of course the goal is to align leaders and followers more effectively at the relationship level to that end mary joe calls mary joe calls a a george mason phd candidate has been working diligently to develop a view of how each attachment style interacts with the others during change Table 8.1 represents the culmination of her very deep analysis in this space. I'll go ahead and describe Table 8.1 to you because that's next. It's necessarily uh, 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 not a matrix. It's a table. It's really, it's a table with uh, topics or categories on the left-hand column. And they pretty much just... Uh, they pretty much describe what kind of followers. Well, there's two sections to it. There's like an upper section for followers and a lower section for um, oh no, this is a, a long table. Okay, this is a long table. So the left hand column are for followers in side of the four respective attachment styles. The secure, the dismissive, the preoccupied, the fearful. So that would be like the stable, the autonomous, the distracted, the insecure. Um, and then and then the right-hand column, for every four sections where the follower, for every four of those follower types, then there is a section for the leader types. So the first section is, where the leader is stable, that's the first row in that column. Where the leader is stable, in parentheses, secure. And then it goes uh, through the left-hand side, whether the follower is stable and the leader is stable, whether the follower is autonomous and the leader being stable, whether the follower is distracted and the leader is still stable, whether the follower is insecure with a stable leader. 
So I can read those to you and then just keep in mind that the next section is going to be where the leader is autonomous and then where the follower is stable with an autonomous leader, where the follower is autonomous with an autonomous leader, where the follower is distracted with an autonomous leader and then an insecure follower with autonomous leader, so on and so forth. So where a follower is stable and a leader is stable, they have matched styles, mutual resilience through change. Mutual high expectations through change. Change should relatively not be an issue, except for challenges related to blind spots and or lack of empathy. So they might match each other only to the extent that they are then required to cover one another's blind spots. But if they both have the same blind spot, then they're going to be SOL. They're going to be shit out of luck for that one. Because, I mean, they're stable enough to not depend on anyone else. So if something gets left undone where they both perceive that they are not, that they're not obligated to do it, or they just, I mean, where they lack the empathy, where they believe they're not obligated, or they simply don't perceive it, like they're blind to it, they may be liable to fuck up. Where the follower is autonomous and the leader is stable, follower avoids change and disengages due to low expectations of others. The leader is resilient to change and doesn't see why the follower has disengaged or avoided change. The leader may not recognize why the follower is upset and have little tolerance for it. This may fulfill the follower's low expectations of the leader and of the change process. The change may not go well for this pair and may result in further damage to the relationship. Where the, where the follower is distracted with a stable leader, the follower is stressed through change and may seek extra validation from the leader. The leader is resilient to change and doesn't understand why the follower has become so needy through change. If the follower, sorry, if the leader has social regulation, time, and resources to provide needed validation, this may go well. If the leader lacks the social regulation, time, and resources to provide the needed validation to the follower, the change may be too much for the follower to handle, which could severely demotivate the follower. Where the follower is insecure and the leader is stable, the follower is mistrustful of those close to him or her, and this is exacerbated during change. The follower appears withdrawn from change, actively avoids change, and suppresses their reactions when around others. The leader is resilient to change and may not pick up on followers' negative reactions or doesn't understand why the follower is more mistrustful than normal. This can result in damaged relationships, but may not appear to have anything to do with the change. Well, I mean, yeah, if they're, if they're just mistrustful, it may not appear to have to do anything with the change. That becomes neurotic. That, that's just neurosis. <laughs> <laughs> That's mental, yo. Where the leader is autonomous. So, where you have a, a stable follower with an autonomous leader, the follower is resilient and comfortable with change. The leader is avoidant of change, which may result in followers experiencing unnecessary time pressure to engage in change if the leader stalls. If the follower found out about unnecessary stalling slash avoidance on the part of the leader, this could result in distrust of the leader going forward, but would likely not result in a poor change process. I can tell you from firsthand experience that it would absolutely result in a poor change process. I mean, here the book is wrong. Matched, <laughs> matched styles where the follower is autonomous and the leader is autonomous. The mutual change expectations for others through change. Both may avoid the change until it absolutely has to be dealt with. However, due to low expectations for others, change may end up well when both finally are forced to deal with it. Mutual understanding of avoidance of change. I mean, that's just, that's just where you got people, uh, that type of management style or that type of work environment is literally putting out fires every day. That's, that's that work environment. And I know, I understand people hate being in those positions. Why? Because you go to work, you go into work and, and, and maybe you yourself don't view yourself as being autonomous, but if you aren't, 
I guess if you haven't been trained, I guess if you haven't been trained to organize for the day or organize for the week or organize for the month, like if you aren't planning ahead, then plan on arriving the day of every morning and run, run buckets from fire to fire, just putting fires out, damage control all fucking day. It's a pain in the ass. Where the follower is distracted, but the leader is autonomous, the follower is stressed through change and may seek extra validation from the leader. The leader is avoidant of change and has low expectations of others, so will likely not be able to provide the needed validation. For an avoidant leader high in empathy, this could end up as a great situation in which helping the follower forces the leader to engage with change. For an avoidant leader low in empathy, this could end very poorly as follower is not supported through change and leader continues to avoid more and more strongly. <laughs> Where the follower is insecure with an autonomous leader, the follower is mistrustful of those close to him or her. And this is exacerbated during change. The leader is avoidant of change as well with low expectations of others. This will likely result in the team as a whole reacting poorly to and avoiding change for compounding reasons. That's just, that, that sounds like a vicious circle where you have an autonomous leader and insecure followers. I mean, if the leader can't cultivate, if the leader can't cultivate loyalty f from insecure followers, if the leader doesn't try to because the leader is avoidant of the change and just doesn't want to lead through change, those followers are going to go from insecure to outright. It's just that those are just going to become outright turnover. That, that, that's, they're going to mutiny. They're going to mutiny from the ship. They're going to jump ship, look for greener pastures, what have you. So next, where the leader is distracted. Where the leader is distracted and the follower is stable, the follower is resilient and comfortable with change. The leader is able to understand and support followers and is reassured by follower resilience. There are good outcomes to be expected here. That, just a side note, that sounds optimal. That sounds fucking optimistic even. But, but, those organizations out there do exist and they might just be your own. Where the follower is autonomous and the leader is distracted. So you have a distracted leader, an autonomous follower. The follower avoids change and disengages due to low expectations of others. The leader understands follower's avoidance, which undermines the leader's confidence. If the leader receives validation from another source, the leader can act in engaging ways to support the follower despite low expectations and avoidance. If the leader does not receive validation from another source, he or she may play into the followers low expectations through inaction so the leader must keep pushing that's just the commentary the leader must keep pushing with a disengaged follower because if you i mean if you follow the follower if you follow through or if you if you play into the followers low expectations you're essentially following the follower you fuck up is what you do <laughs> Where the leader is distracted and you have a distracted follower, you have matched styles. There's mutual high connection and understanding of how others feel. Both may feel insecure and need reassurance to engage with change, but both may also rise to the occasion to provide that support. Personal experience tells me that there are some good expectations, some good outcomes to be expected there as well. Expected. But those expectations tend to be more uh, tenuous, tend to be more touch and go because you have two distracted followers, uh, which, which, which can appear to be, which can appear to both be autonomous when you think about it, because they're they may be distracted, but there's high levels of communication with one another. And in the end, they may be communicating about two independent paths it, it's like having a conversation about nothing where they may just fill the air with noise and it sounds interesting but it's not productive if that makes sense 
where you have a distracted leader and an insecure follower, the follower is mistrustful of those close to him slash her. And this is exacerbated during change. The leader understands the follower's mistrust and likely reasons for mistrust, which undermines the leader's confidence. If the leader receives validation from another source, the leader can work to slowly gain follower trust and encourage the change process. If the leader does not receive validation from another source, expect an action. Sometimes the validation has to come from within. <laughs> Where the leader is insecure, so you have a fearful leader. Where the leader is insecure, but you have a stable follower, the follower is resilient and comfortable with the change. The leader is mistrusting and will likely withdraw from the change process. The follower will be left to fend for him or herself during change, but will likely be okay anyway. The follower will not be understanding and may result in damaged leadership, sorry, and damaged relationship with the leader and likely damaged leadership. Yeah, I mean, you have a stable enough follower and an insecure enough leader somebody's getting knocked off somebody's getting knocked off before someone else gets fired you feel me where the follower is autonomous under an insecure leader the follower avoids change and disengages due to low expectations of others the leader is mistrusting and will likely withdraw from the change process leader in action leader actions will align with low expectations from followers tendency to avoid change to the extent possible Long-term relationship damage not expected due to fulfilled expectations. Where the follower is distracted. When you have a leader who's, that's insecure, with an insecure leader and a distracted follower, the follower is stressed through change and may seek extra validation from the leader. The leader is mistrusting and withdrawn and therefore unlikely to provide needed validation to the follower. Excess relationship seeking on the part of the follower pushes the leader into further withdrawal. Excess withdrawal on the part of the leader further demoralizes and demotivates follower. And it says here, not recommended. Fuck no, not recommended. What the fuck? Where the leader is insecure. You have an insecure leader and an insecure follower. Imagine that. You got matched styles. But ain't shit gonna get done. Watch. There's mutual mistrust that's exacerbated through change. <laughs> Expect each individual to seclude themselves to the extent possible through change rather than acting in relationship. The tendency to withdraw from and avoid change to the extent possible. Yeah, that sounds utterly toxic. That sounds fucking radioactive. If you even come close to each other, some shit might pop off. An understanding, of, yeah, you don't want two, two detached ass motherfuckers, two, two socially detached, reality detached, insecure ass motherfuckers working together. Never, ever, 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 ever. An understanding of the leader follower relationship based on attachment styles provides us with, provides us a few key an understanding of the leader follower relationship based on attachment styles provides us a few key lessons for change. First point is too often, too often change assessments focus on the, is it? On the alignment of the leader. Too often, change assessments focus on the alignment of the leader and the followers in the change effort. Uh, man, I don't know why. It's because it's a page break right here. My apologies. It is too often, change assessments focus on leader traits and styles. It is far more important to focus on the alignment of the leader and the followers in the change effort. The traits of the followers are just as important as the traits of the leaders. There are more followers and we need them to adopt the change. So that's that first point is not to, not to just focus on the leader. The second point is to assess the ability to modulate the attachment style. Organizations often ask leaders to modulate their style based on the situation. However, leaders also need to learn to address different types of attachment styles. 
as leaders mature in organizations, they need to be able to create both awareness and deep understanding of different attachment styles and how to lead these different styles. The next point, create some relationship, even informal. It is possible to create better alignment for leaders and followers to work through periods of change. While it may not be possible to align each person to the perfect formal leader, there are ways to create better leadership structure. This might be done through informal groups of support or through more formal coaching discussions to ensure that critical team members get the support they need during a change effort. So, the last point, comfort yields comfort. When many followers in a group effectively align to leaders based on attachment style, it should have a positive effect on the entire group's adoption of the change. While we have not had the chance to demonstrate this in a setting yet, it stands to reason that the flywheel effect will cause more comfort within the group. And for those who are unfamiliar with the flywheel effect, it's essentially inertia. It's just the accumulation of momentum. It's acquiring momentum through inertia. The more inertia there is, the more momentum it becomes. The more, more, the more momentum is created, the more inertia you have. It's just, that's, and that is, is greasing the wheel. That's like a well-oiled, well-oiled machine. And, 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 and while at the same time you have like a, like a oil, <laughs> never mind. I was going to complicate that example when, when the, essentially it's like the, essentially it's what a flywheel comes off of, which is an engine. Um, but yeah, don't, don't overcomplicate it, Alex. Not yet, at least. How to unstick an organization. How to unstick it. Building on our story, we now know how people get stuck, how organizations get stuck, how to assess the symptoms of an organization looking to move forward, and how to assess leaders and followers. Now, the critical question is, how do we unstick an organization? Or more accurately, how do we help people within an organization who are stuck move from the current state to the future state? There is an entire discipline around this function called change management. For those of you unfamiliar with the discipline, change management supports people with the usage and adoption of new organizational initiatives, leaders, strategies, process, technologies, and, well, anything, it says here. We do not plan to revisit the discipline in this section. There are many great works on the subject. Our goal in this section is to demonstrate how our research on the brain and attachment helps move organizations that get stuck. We want to demonstrate some minor adjustments to change management concepts that can build a better approach to change. The key to success is bringing the brain to the party. A stronger focus on the intuitive brain and the attachment process will build better solutions to support people in their individual response to change. Instead of thinking about resistance to change, we must reframe the conversation to the biological function of attachment and then respond with techniques that account for the lessons of attachment. So, we rethink change management. In general, change management programs follow a similar path. First point, to clearly identify the change. Second, develop a leadership management Sorry, develop a leadership team around the change. Third, develop a strategy to engage the impacted stakeholders. Fourth, implement the strategy with effective communications and training. Fifth, was that fifth or fourth? Fourth, fifth, fifth, develop, <laughs> develop performance measures to ensure that stakeholders continue the new behavior. This is a perfectly fine process for change management. Many organizations have put their own proprietary spin on the approach and have developed unique tools and models to support the approach. The professional organization, the Association of Change Management Professionals, ACMP, has developed a detailed standard for change management, that's copyrighted, standard for change management, that provides a broadly accepted view of the process that is publicly available for consumption. 
We are both founding members of ACMP, supporters of the organization, and design a training program around the standard for change management. There are two problems with these process-focused models of change management. First, they seem to focus more on the process than on the brain of the people involved in the change. One thing that sits at the heart of all of these models is the underlying challenge that organizational change still happens one person at a time. No matter the size of the organization, there is a need to move each person through a change process. They must be willing to let go of their current state and connect with the future state. Many of the process-focused models simply obfuscate the individual perspective within their process. The process itself becomes the end with a connection formed to the process rather than the outcome of change. A side note, side comment here, is that notice how in the military, they don't focus on individual processing. It's literally group processing. They push whole fucking platoons and battalions through. Theirs is a uniform making process. They are uniformizing entire groups of individuals. They give fucks. They give a shit about how you feel about going through the process. You sign the dotted line, and now you will be processed. That's it. End. <laughs> the end, right? But uh, in corporate, it's a little different because in corporate, obviously, there is um, there's no significant contract that that assigns someone's personhood to another individual. Like like a cor- corporate doesn't necessarily own you, like the military might, you know, to that extent, like you you don't become a GI, you don't be, you don't become government issue through corporate. You don't become corporate issue. You have additional freedoms in corporate. You can negotiate for yourself. Just how much do you want to be tied to an organization? How much do you expect the organization to be tied to you? How much can an organization expect to be tied to you, you know, in that sense? So second, change management is not working. Well, it is not working as well as we would like, it says. A seminal 2000 article claims, a seminal 2000 article, it's the year 2000, a seminal 2000 article claims that change management efforts fail 70% of the time. This is probably inaccurate and certainly outdated. Yeah, it's 22 years ago. Mark Hughes and many others have explained the reasons this number is flawed. But the bigger question is, why are we having that debate? With an increasing number of change practitioners around the globe, thousands trained in the discipline, dedicated undergrad and grad programs on the discipline, and even new positions in the public and private sector dedicated to change management, why is there a debate about the success? Because it's not working. Change management is a process-focused industry. Is change, sorry, change management as a process-focused industry is not meeting the brain. Change management as a people-focused discipline can. As John Cotter notes, the world basically uses change management, which is a set of processes and a set of tools and a set of mechanisms that are designed to make sure that when you do try to make some changes, A, it doesn't get out of control, and B, the number of problems associated with it, you know, rebellion among the ranks, bleeding of cash that you can't afford, doesn't happen. So it is a way of making a big change and keeping it, in a sense, under control. I would like to think, because especially after World War II, what was it, the 1950s, when the man in the gray flannel suit was a popular, was a, was a fucking hot item, a lot of these uh, individuals, a lot of like men, came back from war and dived into, jumped into corporate, be it... Uh, factory union, you know, union factories, or be it uh, just, you know, just in the, in the corporate world, when they when they moved from the from the political war 
from the war, from the battlefield, from the political battlefield, from the political wars, to the corporate war. A dollar says that the process-focused industry, change management as a process-focused industry, was much more successful because you had trained militants, trained soldiers coming back ready to take orders. So if they were ordered to change, they changed. Now in 2000s, you got people all up in their feelings. They got to fucking feel a certain type of way. I mean, yeah, it allows us to cultivate and develop the social skills required to persuade and convince and to hustle and to finesse and to sell somebody on a change, you know, to really convince and cultivate some some strong bonds of, of loyalty within a an organization. But it's not as fast. It's not as fast as just applying a process. When it's people focused, I mean, people move like people do. You know what I mean? And when you're dealing with humans, people, when you're dealing with humans, people, <laughs> when you're dealing with humans, humans are as humans be, right? Uh, where change must change. Change management should not be about keeping control, but should be about supporting people through the adoption of new initiatives in an organization. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? Supporting people, where instead of people are supporting the process and, and, and are easily disposable, like soldiers, right? We're now dealing with professionals, and these professionals have fucking leverage. They're corporate motherfucking cowboys. So you better treat your corporate cowboys right. You better know how to treat is, is it treat with or deal with? I don't know. I, I want to say treat is, is that an additional goes a little further than deal with because you're not dealing with corporate cowboys. You shake hands with corporate cowboys, but you better learn how to treat with corporate cowboys. Treat with corporate cowboys in, 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 order, in order to affect the changes that you want to see in your organizations. Any change effort needs to focus on four key questions. The first is, why is the organization changing? The second is, how do stakeholders need to change their behavior? The third, why should stakeholders want to change? The fourth, what do we need to do to avoid them falling into old behavior? Instead of developing more complex processes to think about managing change, organizations can simplify the approach by answering these questions and supporting the people with brain-driven tools. There are five areas that we need to enhance if we want organizations to become unstuck. The first is leadership. The second is communications. The third is training. The fourth is performance management. The fifth is transitional objects. Rethink leadership for the stuck organization. In our aggregate examination of the CDI, we saw that morale is the most common attachment symptom observed in organizations across all sectors, quickly followed by motivation. These symptoms both point to challenges with leadership in the organizations we studied, but it is not just in organizations that took the CDI. Within the FEVS data, F-E-V-S, from the last part, Go click on the last part if you want to if you want to uh, get refreshed on the FEVS data. Go click on uh, on part what is it part seven, part seven. But it is not just in organizations that took the CDI. Within the FEVS data, we see the same challenge. Over the last ten years, we see a consistent trend on questions about leadership. Scores for senior leaders have remained relatively constant over the years, while scores for direct supervisors have gone up modestly. And we know that morale is linked to senior leaders, while motivation is linked to direct supervisors. Against this backdrop, how does an organization attempt to move its people forward through the challenges of today to a brighter future? Identify the loss. Each person has different attachments. For some, it might be to people, but for others, it might be to physical objects in their space. Leaders and managers can effectively work through all these adjustments by engaging with team members to understand what they miss. This can be a group conversation 
or leaders can do these conversations one-on-one. -on -one. The core of the conversation is to identify what people might be missing to understand how to support them through any of these challenges. The conversation may start with, when you think about how we are changing, what are you missing? The answers may be surprising. It could be as big as the psychological contract or as small as an object on their desk. You never know. Design attachment-based leadership profiles. The first step is to acknowledge that leadership is not a function, but a relationship. Like the psychological contract we discussed in chapter 5, leadership rests on an unspoken pact between the leader and the followers. As we described above, leaders can become more effective at understanding and managing different types of attachment styles. Over time, organizations can develop profiles for leaders that track whether the attachment style index assessment and the results align. For example, has the distracted leader been effective at managing the change efforts placed in front of her? Additionally, these profiles can, can be used. It's missing a B there. And I probably would have gone gender neutral in the last sense, but you know me, I'm a fucking continent professional. For example, has the distracted leader been effective at managing the change efforts placed in front of them? Additionally, these profiles can be used to understand where development needs to occur for leaders in the future. Think of leaders as attachment objects. The second step is to acknowledge that the leader is more than just the person. The leader is also a representation of the past memory, emotion, and learning that an employee has developed with the organization and likely before the organization. This means that there is great strength in aligning the right leader to the right situation at the right time, but there is also great risk of removing the right leader at the wrong time. This leads to a few points of practical guidance. First point, be intentional about leader selection, leader alignment, and leader removal. Leverage tools like the ASI to ensure that leaders are being aligned to, to the right followers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leverage tools like the ASI to ensure that leaders are being aligned to the right followers for the situation. Second point, and analyze the loss of key leaders as completely as the loss of other assets in the organization. What are the connection points? Who is impacted? What are the relational gaps? Who is at risk? Who needs support? The third point, build a networked approach to leadership that moves beyond a single hierarchical line of leaders and mitigates the risk of relational loss in organizations to provide broad-based support networks for talented individuals. Diversify leadership roles and expectations. Leadership provides different roles in the attachment process at different levels of the organization. As we saw in the FEVS data, a senior leader supports morale in the organization, whereas a direct supervisor connects more with motivation and the management of conflict. These findings are instructive in how we think about and leverage leaders in our organizations. Senior leaders need to drive the vision of the organization and, in times of change, connect the change to the vision. Senior leaders need to set the tone, while each leader will find their own balance between positivity and authenticity, the tone needs to be appropriate to the leader, the situation, and the followers. Direct supervisors can guide employees through messaging about the organization's direction and any changes coming with tailored emphasis on the employee. They can be the trusted voice. Direct supervisors need training in conflict management. Often, direct supervisors are brought into the role of manager without an understanding of conflict management, and yet this is a major symptom that emerges when employees feel loss. Direct supervisors need relevant, timely, and complete information on the organization if they are going to motivate their employees and provide stability in the organization. Rethink communications programs. 
Our research on attachment theory has taught us three basic lessons on communications in organizations. The first, be honest. Second, be vivid. And third, be heard. These may seem simple, but they are hard to execute. Yet, this is the core of what our brain is looking for when we listen to communications. If we are trying to get people to change their behavior, we are asking them to let go of something in the intuitive brain, which means we need to access the intuitive brain. First point, any confusing language or deviation in message may get them trying to game out our logic. The second, without vivid imagery, we may not hit that emotional or memory core we want. The third, without thinking about how the recipient receives information, we may never be heard. With this in mind, we recommend rethinking communications in three ways. Acknowledge the loss. We both find ourselves telling clients that, man that change management. We both find ourselves telling clients that change management is not magic. We cannot help leaders hide what is happening in the company and make people look elsewhere. Where, when there is a shift from the current state to a future state, many employees feel a sense of loss. Organizations cannot sugarcoat that. Communications must acknowledge the loss. There is often a logical business reason for the change, and it will likely fill in the blank, save money, make money, yield efficiency, yield effectiveness, create organizational strength, but it will not be easy for everyone. The sooner and more regularly the communications acknowledge the loss without harping on it and being negative, the more authentic and successful the program will be. Develop the storytelling. When we talk about making a change in an organization, we often talk about the business need for the change. We, even the business need for the change can come with a compelling story. Here's why. Researcher Yuri Hassan has demonstrated through a series of studies and one compelling TED Talk of how brains can couple through storytelling. Storytelling can bring together the two parts of the brain in a way that a standard presentation on business will not. Put that together with the part of the brain we are trying to impact, the intuitive brain, where we know that we need to hit memory or emotion and there is little value in a traditional business case. If we want to unlock the intuitive brain, we need to share memories, not messages, Tales, not talking tales instead of talking points. I tried to uh, I tried to fucking amend that <laughs> on the fly. If we want to unlock the intuitive brain, we need to share memories, not messages, tales instead of talking points. I like the sound of that, and that's true. And that's true. There needs to be uh, there needs to be a, a vision to go with the message, not just the message, but a vision, an, an end game, some kind of some kind of uh, picture of what success looks like. They need to see success. They need to see that light at the end of the tunnel in order to even travel through the tunnel and in, in, in order to consider entering the tunnel. I mean, once they're in the tunnel, I mean, you got to show them the light. You have to be the light sometimes. As a leader, you have to let the light inside shine as the leader. And that goes hand in hand with what uh, I think a couple paragraphs up. You have to find the motivation, the validation from within to keep moving. Because if you seek external validation and, and you got tunnel vision, bruh, you're fucking lost. You're fucking lost, fam. Diversify the techniques for active and passive communication. Often in an enterprise transformation, there may be a broad-based there may be a broad-based communications program that will need... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how I messed that up. I don't know how I messed that up. Often, in an enterprise transformation, there may be a broad-based communications program that will include a variety of communications... That will include a variety of communications messages. I mean, some of this, some of this needs... 
revision, right? And, I, and I, again, I say this, I think every episode now, if I fuck up, I'm going to say 50% of the time, it may be myself. I'm not going to say 49% of the time. It might be myself. You know, I'm being optimistic here. I'm being idealistic here because I'm, I would like to think that I'm constantly improving my, uh, my verbal skill, my, my ability to orate and pronounce and read out loud, you know, because that'll come in, that comes in handy every day as a fucking professional. 51% of the time, it might be a typo, some kind of grammatical error in the writing, which I try, I try to revise and I try to correct in real time. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes, sometimes because it's the first edition, it's going to be full of, not full, but it's going to have more typographical and grammatical errors than one would like, but hopefully 2023 rolls around and the second edition reads better. I'm going to say maybe not because this is very academic. Uh, it's not so much doctrinal where, I mean, it's not so much a doctrine that they're putting into like a textbook. This is more like an, like an academic manuscript. So it's probably just one and done. So, you know, bear with me, bear with me as I read along and correct as I go along where, where I need to in places where I, I feel it's required. Often in an enterprise transformation, there may be a broad-based communications program that will include a variety of communications messages, mediums, and messengers. However, these variations may be oversimplified and may not get at the real differences in the organizational populations. Based on the work of attachment styles, we know that people respond to change in different ways. Some will actively seek support because they are looking for engagements with individuals, they are distracted, or the organization, they are, might be stable. Others are more likely to withdraw into their echo chamber of self-examination and reflection. They may be autonomous or concerned. They might be anxious. As a result, the communication techniques and mediums must be varied to meet these types. Logistically, this means creating town hall sessions and conference calls to answer in-depth questions for the distracted slash stable, but also publishing the same information for the autonomous slash anxious. It may mean offering coaching packets with detailed information for direct supervisors, but also giving supervisors the latitude to hand those materials over to employees who may not engage effectively in those conversations. One of the keys to successfully moving an organization forward is training. As any new paradigm enters the organization, there is a need to train people on the shift, whether it is a new strategy, a new process, a new leader, or a new technology. Team leaders need to learn how to succeed in the future state. This often means new skills. However, often the skills are really a secondary objective to the new behaviors sought through the change program. Our collective research is instructive in rethinking training in three ways to focus more on relearning behavior rather than simple skills training. Build desire through training. Many change management approaches have a part of the model that focuses on the readiness, willingness, and the desire for change. This part sits at the beginning of the change management process, and it becomes a gate or a milestone which the program must pass before the initiative can move forward. For example, a statement may be made like, we must assess the readiness for change, then communicate the need for the change in a way that makes the case for change at a business level. We will then make the individual case for change in a personal way. This will help build up the individual readiness, willingness, or desire for change. Then we will train them. It's wrong. <laughs> it says it's wrong. This is not the way our, way our brain works. I was about to say our Wayne works. 
This is not the way our brain works. Our brain is not linear. I mean, the, I'm going to say it's 50-50, man. It's 50-50. Our brain, to an extent, is highly logical and highly rational, and one could argue very linear, but not entirely. Not entirely, which is why feeling an emotion plays such a large part in our lives. Not everything is is comes down to natural order unfortunately this is not the way our brain works our brain is not linear as we have looked at the intuitive brain in this book we have shown you that the limbic system brings together memory emotion and learning in one place desire to change is an emotional process and for most people it cannot be overcome by logic or it cannot be overcome by logic and voiced emotion, e.g. a message of what's in it for me. Instead, most people need to learn the change to create the willingness to change. Habit-forming experts often tell people, try something for 21 days to form the habit. The process of learning and forming new memories will form the emotional comfort with the change. Hearing is not believing, and neither is seeing living it is believing living it is believing i was i was going to say living it living it is believing yeah hearing is not believing and neither is seeing living it is believing i like that i might use that quote build memories through learning practically Programs focused on behavior change should prioritize training over communications. If it is a new technology an organization is rolling out, help people see the system. Get hands on the keyboard. When they feel it, they will be more likely to understand the value and be more likely to adopt it. In addition to learning the skills and building an emotional connection with the new tool, they will be building memories that will reinforce the emotions and learning. For this reason, nothing beats the shared experience of classroom learning with colleagues. It may sound a little old school, but it still works best because it takes all the other noise out of the equation. Could notwithstanding, it says here, these types of environments create something completely new to share among a team of colleagues. Gamify learning. Some people love games. Some people can't stand them. Regardless of what camp you fall into, there are two practical reasons to gamify learning programs. First, there is so much noise and or, and or ah, there is so much noise, apologies. There is so much noise in organizations that every change needs to break through with creativity. Games help get attention and mind space in the crowded field. Second, and more to the point of the research we presented here, is the transitional space. Games bring people out of their current space into a new space where they can learn and explore before trying to get them into a future state. This transitional space is a very successful place for helping the brain rewire and learn new skills and behaviors. In many... No, not not. The, the, the subsection for this one is rethink, rethink performance management, rethink performance management. In many change management discussions, performance conversations make two common errors. They are ignored or they are overcomplicated. If they are ignored, it is because the change management team believes that training and communications are change management. Wrong. Incentives change behaviors. Without strong incentives, new behaviors will backslide to comfortable old ones every time. If performance management is overcomplicated, it is because the change management team becomes worried about demonstrating their credit for the effort compared to another team involved in the effort. Of course, these organizational dynamics are real and cannot be ignored. The reality is that there should be only one set of performance measures, those set out by the change effort. 
The real question is how to use research on the brain to roll out performance incentives differently and drive behavior change more effectively. Make the money emotional. We know that cognitively encouraging individuals to change for monetary reasons is a very logic-based approach to change. It should work on its own. Often, it doesn't because people struggle to understand what the money might mean. For example, telling someone that proper compliance with the new program will yield a 1% increase in the bonus pool means what exactly? However, messaging the same story as compliance with a new program will yield an average of $3,200, that's $3,200 American dollars, US dollars, for each person in the bonus pool or the equivalent of a cruise for two to the Bahamas suddenly plants a picture in the mind of what they might be working toward. Now, some may dismiss the image immediately, but they are likely to replace it with their own image because you have now encouraged them to think that way. This is no longer a monetary goal. It is an emotional goal. That makes sense. Just a side commentary right here. That makes absolute sense. And that continues with keeping the vision at the forefront, keeping that light at the tunnel, providing a, uh, a sort of uh, telescope in order to zoom in on that light and, and give them a picture, give, it a, give, give them a snapshot of what it looks like when they exit that change tunnel. When, when, <laughs> when they're a bullet seated in the chamber, right? And they are looking down the end of that barrel. All they see is, is, is just one dot of light, one, one point, one ray of sunshine, right? As it enters the bullet, as it enters the, down the barrel and, uh, and then they, and then they, uh, must travel, must travel out and into the world, but providing them with a wider snapshot of what the world looks like, you know, might, might give that bullet additional incentive, you know? If, if you put them on target and show them what the target is, it would provide them with that additional incentive to hit their mark. Because, I mean, obviously people aren't just inanimate bullets, you know, bullets with no names. People are people and they have names and they have ambitions and they have dreams and they have emotions and feelings. So you definitely want to provide them with the sense that monetary gain will lend itself to emotional satisfaction. Even though money itself won't satisfy you emotionally, it's what money can provide. It's a tool. It's a tool. You gotta think rich to be rich. Reward intuitive brain milestones. Conversely, it is also advisable to reward behavior that sits in the intuitive brain. Instead of just rewarding the core outcomes of the change efforts, find ways to reward the efforts that support adoption and usage of the change effort. Those items that support change of memory, emotions, and learning behaviors. This might look like a spot reward to someone who successfully completes all the training programs for a new technology first. It might be an imagery contest where team members are invited to create visuals for a new strategy and a prize is awarded to the most overall, to the most effective overall visual. I would say the most overall effective visual, but uh, you know, I think that's the stylistic difference between how the author writes and how I myself, Alex, would write that. Or it might be a storytelling competition to build off of the communication section above where an Award is established for those who demonstrate the principles of a new values program effectively. Although this sounds a little cheesy, all of these examples have been deployed in Fortune 500 companies over the last few years with significant success because they tie behavior change with emotional attachments and reinforce the behavior with real incentives. Develop transitional objects. In chapter five, we discussed how individuals 
lean on objects throughout their life, but especially in periods of change. Transitional objects provide a critical support mechanism through change. In many cases, organizations develop transitional objects without realizing it. These objects serve as the bridge between a current object that someone leans on for support and a future state where they do not need that object. In short, the object helps provide comfort or support through the period of loss. The power of transitional objects. Often, project teams implementing a change will go to the corporate catalog and order generic giveaway products for a project. This is a missed opportunity to intentionally identify a transitional object to support the individuals in the program through the change. In her first book, The Pivot Point, Victoria used the device of an allegory of a group of people during a storm to describe the role of attachment. For this group, she had the protagonist offer them a gift to be opened later. It turned out to be an empty box, but it didn't matter. They all kept it with them during the storm. During a critical period of leadership loss on one of Patrick's projects, he provided his team with he provided his team a tactile device, a tactile device or toy called a tangle. A tangle sounds like a fidget spinner, right? During a critical period of leadership loss on one of Patrick's projects, he provided his team a tactile device or toy called a tangle. He told them that the team would be losing a key leader and that they had the opportunity to use the device during time of stress to both relieve their stress and think creatively about how to get through it. The goal was to get creative, not get stuck. Patrick was telling his story in a crowd three years later, and one of the team members still had the tangle. <laughs> what? I'm, I'm, well, okay, maybe they just had it. They, maybe they weren't actively using it, and if they were actively using it, Maybe it wasn't for that one period of leadership loss. And if it was for that one period of, that one critical period of leadership loss, fam, you got issues, man. Let go of that fool. It's been three years. It's been three years. I, don't let go of the team member. Let go of the leader who left, right? The leader ascended. The leader moved on. Maybe didn't ascend, but they moved on. And it's time the team member did also. I mean, that... The, a leader leaving or moving on should inspire others to do the same. Always for the better. Never, never slide. Never slide down. The transitional person. There are many possible transitional objects, and each major change effort requires a transitional object to make sense of the effort. Sometimes the transitional object is a person. Often, leaders play temporary roles in times of change such as change champions or change agents, which is a wonderful way to create a transitional experience within a program. A trusted person in a key role provides a sense of familiarity to people, while also signifying a bridge between the past and the future. Identifying the right person is critical and depends on finding someone who is a connector that brings together people from many parts of the organization, which is required for successful adoption, not just the loudest voice. The transitional object. The key is to identify an object that serves as a bridge to the mission or the people of the current state while supporting the change and the behavior of the future state. In fact, as much as possible, the object should either directly encourage the people through the behavior change or support, or support them. In fact, as much as possible, the object should either directly encourage the people through the behavior change or support them with the loss of the change. For example, in an organization where a new time tracking system was being introduced, the transitional object was a giveaway during the promotional campaign that was a laptop camera cover with the new time tracking link on it. This was both a helpful giveaway and a subtle reminder of the change in behavior. There is a practical exercise at the end of this chapter that helps you develop your own transitional object. 
Really? Just a laptop camera cover? God damn, bro. Put a fucking post it on that bitch. <laughs> many organizations get stuck between <laughs> many organizations get stuck because employees feel a sense of loss during a significant change effort. We can't keep up and we demonstrate our sense of loss through measurable and observable symptoms in chapter seven. Organizations can do better chapter seven or part eight. Go listen to part eight if you're interested. Organizations can do better can do better for change efforts. Organizations can do better for change efforts by more effectively aligning leaders and followers based on attachment styles to create a better sense of comfort through change. Leaders can do more to improve the process for employees through more effective change management that uses our full understanding of the brain to support our people. So often when leaders approach a change effort they simply start from the wrong part of the brain. They start with the logical case for change first, but they fail to account for the intuitive brain. A rethinking of core change management functions with the addition of the transitional object will yield a more effective and more human approach to change. Don't start with logic. Let's start with where things get stuck. Hmm. Practical exercises. This first one is apply leader follower questionnaire. It, it's, it's applying first, and this is a leader follower questionnaire. There are many versions of the leader member exchange questionnaire. The version in table 8.2 is inspired by the LMX7 from Grain and Ulbain. 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 It's two, uh, it's two authors' names. It's two researchers' names. One is Grayen, G-R-A-E-N, and the other is Ul Bien. It's U-H-L-B-I-E-N, Bien. This tool demonstrates how to apply the concepts in your own work. As a leader, you would answer these questions. You would answer, as a leader, you would answer this questionnaire about each person who reports to you. As a follower, you would answer this about your leader. Ideally, you will get both sides of the response and be able to compare the responses to better understand the relationship. For a leader with multiple followers, the leader will fill out many surveys, while each follower will fill out only one. Let me take a quick drink because I got the hiccups. You know how to get rid of them, right? little gold nugget for you in this in this episode take a take a drink no take a sip of water right hold it in your mouth turn your head to one side and then swallow take another sip of water hold it in your mouth turn your head to the other side and swallow literally just turn your head at the neck to the to the left like over like uh, not trying to but like move your left ear closer to your left shoulder yeah just turn your head over to the side swallow and then the other side your right ear towards your right shoulder and swallow yeah it's two drinks two drinks and you're done two sips of water you're good table 8.2 is the leader follower survey and there are questions on the left hand column and then across the top row there are uh, five rows, sorry, five columns with a one, a two, a three, or four, or five. It's a questionnaire from one to five of this survey, the one being rarely and the five being very often. So one is rarely, two is occasionally, three is sometimes, four is fairly often, and five is very often. So if you want to create this survey from how I'm seeing it, I will describe it to you. I will read the questions and then you'll have to hand it off to uh, your leaders and your followers and your groups, um, obviously amending the questions to have them pertain to the leader or the follower because in this exercise, the questions are phrased with leader slash follower, but in real time, in, in real life, you want to amend the question and have it say uh, leader 
or follower, depending on who you hand the question you're off to. So question one, how often do you know whether your leader slash follower is satisfied with your performance? Question two, oh man, they change up from rarely to very often. So the first one would have been one being rarely, two occasionally, three sometimes, four fairly often, and five very often. Question two, how well does your leader slash follower understand your daily challenges in the organization? One, not a bit. Two, a little. Three, a fair amount. Four, quite a bit. Or five, a great deal. Question three, how well does your leader slash follower recognize your potential within the organization? One, not at all. Two, a little. Three, moderately. Four, mostly. Five, fully. Question four, what is the likelihood of the leader slash follower to use the influence they have available to help them with your workplace challenges? One, none. Two, small. Three, moderate. Four, high. Five, very high. Question five. What is the likelihood the leader follower slash follower would directly engage with you to help you complete the tasks of your work? One, none. Two, small. Three, moderate. Four, high. Five, very high. Question six. I have enough confidence in my leader slash follower to defend a decision even if he or she even if they were not present to do so. One would be strongly disagree. Two is disagree. Three is neutral. Four is agree. Five is strongly agree. Question seven. How effective is your working relationship with the leader slash follower? One would be extremely ineffective. Two would be worse than average. Three is average. Four is better than average. Five, extremely effective. The next exercise would just be to observe. Look at the areas in table 8.3 that are common functions in change management. How does your organization do on each of these areas from a zero, non-existent, to a five, a perfect score? If you score something as a three or a lower, review the recommendations in that section. What one item would you take and try to implement for your organization? What, what one item would you try and take to implement for your organization to make it more effective and more human? So table 8.3 is scoring your org. That's the title of it. Score your org. The left-hand column is uh, the functional areas. And the right-hand column is literally just asking you to rate from zero to five. Zero being non-existent, five being perfect. So you want to rate the functional areas on the left and put the number in on the right. Again, if you want to create this table on a piece of paper, you can do so. I will read to you the functional areas. I don't have to read to you like the scores because they don't change like the last exercise did. So the first functional area is leadership. Go ahead and score your org. The next is communications. The third is training. The fourth is performance management. And the five, the fifth, the fifth is transitional objects. All right, the last exercise is to apply. Build the bridge, dash identifying the right transitional object. So the purpose of this exercise is to help identify a transitional object that will support your organization through a change effort. So the first bullet here is to fold a piece of paper lengthwise and in half to create four boxes on the page. In the upper left hand corner, label the box organization. In the upper, in, sorry, in the lower left hand corner, label the box change. In the upper right hand corner, label the box emotion. In the lower right-hand corner, label the box behavior. I'll, I will repeat that because I know I fucked up on the second. 
the upper left hand corner is organization. The upper, I fucked that up again. The upper left hand corner is organization. The lower left hand corner or box is change. So upper left is organization, lower left is change, upper right is emotion, and lower right is behavior. The next says, when you think of the mission or the people of your organization, what comes to mind? What symbols, visuals, and physical things that represent the organization? Write the list in the organization box. Next, think about the change or transformation that is about to happen for the people in the organization. When you think about the change itself, what kind of change is happening? Where in the organization is it happening? Third, think about the key emotional reactions you might get to the change. What do you expect to see? What do you want to see? What is the gap? What emotions do you need to see? Creativity, play, or care? And those are aspects from, I believe, part six, part five or part six of the book. So go back, refresh your memory on what creativity has to do with play and care. Last, think about the behavior that needs to change in the organization. What do people need to differently, what? What do people need to differently because of the, what do people need to do differently? Yeah, because it's behavior. Last, think about the behavior that needs to change in the organization. What do people need to do differently because of the change or transformation? How will their job change? Where will this happen? Will it be at their desk? Will it be elsewhere? A new physical location? Look at the lists you created and the items on them. What are the connection points across the four boxes? What are the common elements of the organization and the change? What about the behavior is new? That concludes that exercise and this chapter. This has been chapter eight of Stuck, How to Win at Understanding Loss. And that's the end of part nine of this episode of the Corporate Cowboys podcast. If you would like, or I mean, I insist, I insist you like, follow, subscribe, you share this, you share the corporate love with those closest to you. I get that this audiobook may be boring to some, but to, uh, to those consummate professionals, to those corporate cowboys in constant development, development, constantly developing professionalism, it's, it's unending. It's never ending. It's the, the hustle is forever. The hustle is forever. The struggle, the struggle we want to be short term, obviously, but the hustle is for life. So follow us on Instagram. It's the corporate cowboys with a Z corporate cowboys is the handle. I mean, the page name is just corporate cowboys. You'll find us. You'll recognize the picture. You can subscribe to the Patreon. There are multiple tiers. If you want to, you know, be affiliated if you would like to be a, a contributor and uh, keep this operation not for profit, you just, just just pay admission. Pay admission to the corporate war. You'll get front row seats. I mean, we're all we're all entry level forever, and that is the first tier. It's a dollar, a dollar a month, one dollar a month, and I believe it goes up to like a like hundred. We kept it consistent with uh, with with the U.S. denomination, with the U.S. currency. So there's there's a one dollar. Maybe we'll add a two dollar. Just you know. For, for the sake of novelty. But there's a one, a five, a 10, a 20, a 50, and a $100 tier. Um, as far as you know, their, their benefits, they vary. Go ahead and take a look at them. I don't have them all off the top of my head. I just help set them up and I help create the content and keep the mission first. Keep the mission first. And that is to create leaders. That is to inculcate professionals with values of a corporate cowboy, to be better professionals every day. And for that, I'm going to wish you a great rest of your week, wherever you are. Pretend, today's, pretend it's Monday today. Tomorrow is the rest of your week. <laughs> Catch you next time.